All right. Hello, everybody. Um, we are moving towards the um, conclusion of our, uh, well, not really. We have two more events going on. They're both remarkable sessions. I hope everyone is um, has been pacing themselves. I did want to like single out the questions so far, but extraordinary in the breakout uh, on the main stage. We really appreciate the engagement. Part of what we hope to do here is involve all of you in conversation. It's not so much about us talking to you. It's about us you know, talking together. So again, the, uh, it's been really great to hear all of these great questions. I, I do want to promise, and I will promise that you know, all of the many questions we're not able to answer, we are going to make every effort to answer after the fact. You hope everyone who's spoken is willing to give out their emails. We'll share those uh, you know, after the event. And we will, again, try to get you answers to all of your good queries, because we know they are all uh, very valuable questions, and we appreciate the thought behind them. So you know, real quickly, uh, the you guys have a choice now. Um, it's a good choice. You really can't go wrong. But uh, everyone now can choose to either stay where they are on the main stage to hear author Rainsford Stauffer, or you can go into the breakout sessions and you talk to each other. Each breakout session now is going to be anchored and joined by a nation editor. You know, they're all terrific. I know them all well. So they're all people you would like to meet. So you can either, again, go off to one of the sessions now and just you know, find the group you'd like and fill in or else stay here and hear Rainsford, you know, which will be an extraordinary experience. I can guarantee. So, you know, make your choice now. And, um, you know, we will, again, take one minute to let you sort out where you're going to go. And your know, Rainsford is someone who I'm excited to introduce. You know, she's an author. She writes a monthly column for Teen Vogue. She's a freelance writer. She's written two books. You know, the first book, um, An Ordinary Age, came out you know, over the pandemic. And her second book, All the Gold Stars, it's a great title, isn't it? Actually comes out on Tuesday. So, you know, it's forthcoming in about two days. We're very excited about it. You know, the book has received lavish advanced praise. And so, you know, in trying to put it together, it took me a while. So I'm going to, excuse me, just read from it because, you know, this stuff is too good to try to paraphrase. Uh, so again, you know, her new book, All the Gold Stars, looks at how the cultural, personal, and society, societal expectations or an ambition are driving a burnout epidemic, might sound familiar, eliminating our expectations and pushing us further apart. Through the devastating personal narrative of her own ambition crisis, Stauffer has discovered common factors driving us all, peeling back the layers of family expectations, capitalism, and self-esteem that dangerously tie up our worth and our output. Interviews with she does interviews with students, parents, workers, psychologists, and labor organizers who all offer a new definition of ambition. I mean, she's trying to kind of do no less and redefine what ambition means. Uh, her lessons are important for everyone, but particularly important for young journalists just starting out. Uh, so again, I'm very excited to hear what she has to say. There's a lot I can learn. Uh, so again, please you know, pay attention. As I said earlier, though, you know, she does have a lot to say, but she also is a really good listener. So she doesn't want to get up here and lecture. She has some prepared remarks. Mark. She's not going to take too long with them, though. So please come with questions. Come, you know, ready to talk and engage because that's what we want to get here. So again, you know, I've taken longer than I hoped, but again, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Rainsford Stauffer. Oh my gosh, Peter! Thank you so much. I am honored by your remarks. I'm honored to be here with you all today. I know that you have been in so many amazing sessions and conversations over the course of the day. So I'm excited to get to be part of that. Um, like I said, or like Peter said, I'm hoping that this can be kind of an informal thing that's more like a conversation. I'm going to talk through a little bit of what I learned over the course of reporting this book, and then we can just have a conversation about what's on your mind regarding related issues. Most of the things that I'm touching on here that came up for me over the course of reporting the book and working on the book are things that I'm now trying to apply to my own life and to my own work, and that includes my journalism work. So most of what I'll touch on here is about how what I heard from people while reporting has kind of helped me shift the structure of the approach to my work. And it's a lot of advice, not coincidentally, that I wish someone had either given me earlier or I wish I had known to take earlier. Um, and then toward the end, if you have specific questions on writing and reporting, on pitching a story, finding angles, all that good stuff, we can get into more journalism specific questions as well. 
So before we totally dive in here, to give you a little bit of background, um, like Peter said, I am a freelance journalist, I'm an author, and I write a mostly monthly column for Teen Vogue called Work in Progress, which is really about kind of starting out making your way in the working world and kind of the issues that arise within that transition. Um, but my second book is about reimagining ambition, and specifically, it looks at the emphasis that this hyper individualistic kind of achieve at all costs endless churn of capitalism kind of ambition manifests in structures like work and school and how that sort of reinforces the pressure to achieve certain things on certain timelines and in a certain way and beyond that i was really curious to know where people were pouring the things that i associated with ambition like care intention drive into areas that we might think of as meaningful, but don't necessarily get thought of as ambitious. And so to me, some of those things looked like community, friendships, how we care for each other. These are things that I noticed ambition really wasn't a part of the conversation on. It seemed like a lot of the time when I heard about ambition, when my ambition was criticized, when my ambition was encouraged, was really about how you go upward, how you climb a ladder, how you achieve the next thing. And I was curious about how people were kind of trying to expand that outward instead to make it a different part of their life than something that was just so achievement focused. And so that kind of sounds cheesy out of context. It's a little bit of a thinky idea writing about ambition, but what grounds me when I'm writing about anything is people's stories and getting to listen um, to how an issue has impacted them, how they're thinking about something in the context of their own life experience. So while ambition itself might be a quality or a feeling, what I tried to do with the book is look closer at how that's reinforced or upheld through our systems and structures. So people talked about familial expectations and the pressure parents had put on them to be a certain kind of ambitious, religion, religion's impact on ambition and self-worth. The book includes an overview of the origins of standardized testing and gifted and talented tracking and how there's a certain kind of ambition that's celebrated really early that people experienced when they were young people, when they were students, and it stayed with them in certain ways all through adulthood. And unsurprisingly, probably to everyone here, the book also looks a lot at work because this idea of the quote unquote overwork epidemic that everybody is working too much is really something that is in part fueled by ambition. And it intersects with a lot of economic injustice, access to opportunity and lack of resources for that people need to make safe, fulfilled decisions about their lives. And when I think about this, there are a lot of conversations that come to mind about the relationship with work and working conditions and the pressures that people were facing because of those conditions. But there's one conversation with a 22 year old, Brittany, who that conversation just stayed with me all throughout reporting the book. And even now, like I said, Brittany was 22 and had been hired at a New York City hospital right as the pandemic surged, right when everything started shutting down in New York. Part of Brittany's morning routine included walking past morgue trucks that were lining the street outside of her workplace. So from the beginning, there was an intense amount of trauma and an intense amount of overwork in her relationship to work. She talked about trauma compounding in her job, including how as a black woman, she was watching patients die of COVID-19 at the same time protests were unfolding following the murder of George Floyd. It just became a lot. And she actually ended up in the hospital because it took such a toll on her physical health. She told me that she had dropped what she called the societal expectations to achieve because walking away with her life intact was all that she could ask for. And she said something that really, like I said, stayed with me throughout the process of reporting all the rest of it, which is that we have to organize for us, for our lives, for our livelihoods, because our workplaces are sure as hell organizing for their best interests. And I think that that just kind of says it all. 
whether you are someone who is reporting on work, whether you are a student and working, or you're just dealing with the pressure of school, I think that there is this unspoken idea or spoken idea in some cases that how hard you work and what you achieve and how early you do it, that's your self-worth. That's where you can earn a self that you're proud of. And I was really curious to figure out how to push back on that. So while reporting, I talked to people who were ambitious about advocating for care infrastructure, who talked about unionizing their workplaces or developing new structures of work that felt more supported and more sustainable. I talked to people about how they were being ambitious about investing in their relationships with other people, which looked like supporting their communities, being part of local mutual aid initiatives, how they were taking care of their friends, even hobbies. And we know that two things can be true at once. We know we can know that we're more than what we produce, that you are more than the last thing you wrote or how you perform in school or what you do at work. And we can want to lead a fulfilling life. And sometimes that includes doing work that feels really meaningful to us. I think that I'm probably um, not saying anything you all don't already know since you are at a journalism conference on a beautiful Saturday. Um, but I think it's important to point out that both of those things can be true at the same time. And so I kind of wanted to start there today to talk about how I think about reporting on work, because really people and the experiences they're having and how they're seeing those experiences play out in their lives, in the resources they have and how they feel about themselves. That's kind of the core of why I do what I do and how I think about work and how I try to report on it. And I think that there's a lot of pressure on everyone, but especially on young people, to feel like you have to have it all figured out and hold it all together all the time. And I would imagine that that goes in some ways double for young people who are journalists, who are navigating a bunch of conflicting pressures and obligations at work and kind of holding that with this passion you have for the field that you're entering and for the field that you're in. You're passionate about journalism. That's why you're here this weekend. You're ambitious about that work and we need that ambition. So after thinking probably too much about ambition over the past couple of years, I wanted to walk through three tips that I learned over the course of reporting this that felt like they taught me something about how I approach my journalism work um, and the things that I really wish I'd known when I was a young journalist myself. So the first one is that you're not behind which is a hilarious thing to talk about with you all because you are so, so far ahead of where I was when I started out my career in my early 20s. Just by the fact that you have managed to find this resource, that you've managed to be part of this community of people that are here this weekend, that is incredible. And it shows that you're doing such incredible things, not just for your own work, but like I said, for how you show up in a community with other journalists as well. But this is the refrain I hear from people a lot. And I heard it from nearly every single person I interviewed for this book. I interviewed well over 100 people who unfortunately are not all represented in the pages, but all of whom stories kind of informed my thinking. And it did not matter what age they were, what job they were in, what their relationship to ambition was in terms of whether they felt like they were quote unquote ambitious or not. I heard it all the time. I'm not doing enough. I'm falling behind. Everyone knows what they're doing and I don't. And when I first tried to enter this field, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. The amount of embarrassing pitches that editors have in their inboxes for me is incredible and probably overwhelming. And it was all grounded in this idea that I was behind. I was rushing to make sure I got there eventually, that I entered the field, that I caught up to where I thought I was supposed to be. And honestly, it led to writing stuff that I would never, ever write today. And I think that that all came from the pressure to get there as fast as I could. Like I said, you all know this better than me, but student journalism is uniquely impactful. In the past, I've even hesitated calling it student journalism because I think good, meaningful journalism is just good, meaningful journalism. 
But I do think that being a young person, being a student gives you a unique lens through which to think about and consider questions that you want to ask, questions you want to answer in your own work. And you already know this, but I think it's important to reinforce that the work you do now matters, not just the work you'll do 10 years in the future, which I'm sure will be equally great. But the flip side of that, that the work matters now, that your work is impactful now, is that that doesn't mean you have to know everything about who you are as a writer, what you cover, what you want to write about in the future right now. It is okay to slow down. It's okay to take a breather. It is okay to say that you don't know and ask for help. And especially if you're a freelancer, which I know a lot of young journalists are, that's kind of how you break into this sometimes, it can be really intimidating to say, I don't know, I need help, and I don't know where to get it. But I think it is one of the most impactful lessons that I have learned, and I wish that I had learned it earlier, that you don't have to know everything all the time. Your work will be better if you own what you don't know, because that's how you discover things. That's how you find out. That's how you build community. It's how you build trust with sources. It's kind of why you're asking questions in the first place. And the idea that you're only as good as your last big byline or your last big internship or your last big achievement, it is such capitalistic BS. And that is where this feeling of being behind stems from. So that's kind of the first thinky lesson that I've learned over the course of reporting this is you're not behind. You're moving on a time frame that works for you. You are going to continue to gain knowledge as you go. And it's not a race. Doing really great, meaningful work is not always about getting there first. And I know depending on your beat, scoops are important. Those matter. But again, those come from slowing down long enough sometimes to build a relationship with a source so they trust you, so they want to come to you with information. And I think that there's something to be said for taking your time. Number two is that your life outside of your work can actually benefit your work. I know this is a tricky one for a lot of us, myself included, because when you care about something, when you're really ambitious about it, it does kind of become part of you. What prompted me to even think about ambition in this way in the first place is that I felt like I had entirely lost it. It was during a stretch of my life where my physical and mental health were a disaster, my personal life had completely fallen apart, and I really didn't feel like I had anything left to give. That terrified me because before that, ambition was kind of at the core of who I was. I loved my work. I wanted to do it all the time. I wanted to get better at it. I wanted to practice, and it was like a switch had flipped. I suddenly had no ideas and didn't think I'd ever have one again. I just didn't care the way that I cared before. And it didn't feel just like being unmotivated at my job. It felt like I had sort of lost my sense of self. And especially when I talk to students, this is something that comes up a lot, especially because a lot of you are under so many different conflicting pressures, so many different things that want or need a piece of you. It's very easy when you're giving your all to all of these things to look up and realize that you don't feel like you have anything left to offer. And so as a result, for a long time, I believed that the opposite of overwork was doing absolutely nothing. No more ambition. That's it. All done. And I would imagine that some of you have had your own version of that, where someone tells you, don't be afraid to take a break, rest, go out and have fun. And a lot of the time, that very well-intentioned advice just doesn't feel practical to the kind of work that you're doing. When I was thinking about this this morning before I got on to chat with you all, I was thinking about for the work in progress column that I write at Teen Vogue, one of our very first questions out of the gate was about boundaries around work and not becoming a workaholic. And I was like, I am the wrong person to answer this question. I write and have a day job. I went to college full time and worked full time. And my whole thing was over work. It would have been hypocritical of me to say otherwise. And I think in answering that, one of the things I thought about is how having a balance between your work and your life does kind of put this burden on individual workers. And I think that that's true for students, too. You don't control the amount of homework you're assigned and how your teachers or professors set deadlines. If you're working, you don't necessarily have control over your schedule. And 
it's easy for people to say, just take a break. It's a lot harder for the circumstances and conditions around your work to make it feel like that's possible. But the thing that I've learned while reporting this book uh, and about writing through my writing in general is that you can be ambitious about your work and be ambitious about other parts of your life. And in my opinion, it will make your work better. Every interaction you have, every community you're part of and invest in, every opportunity you have to explore something, even if it isn't related to journalism, it's informing your thinking and it's helping you notice what issues are arising in your community and with your neighbors and with your peers. It's kind of like creating space for observation and it's opening you up. So even if you don't have a ton of free time to go take up a new hobby unrelated to writing, I would encourage you to give yourself enough space to slow down and notice because with that comes a lot of mental freedom in terms of how you think about new ideas, how you notice new issues, how you invest care in yourself so you can do the kind of work that you want to do in the long run. The last one, and then you all, I promise I'll stop talking, is that we're learning from each other all of the time. And I think that while I was reporting the book, what kept striking me over and over again is how individualistic ambition is a lot of the time. This idea that you need to be completely self-reliant, you need to have it all figured out, you need to be able to go it alone. It's so profoundly isolating. And I think in, in general, but especially in terms of journalism, it's so limiting. The best writing advice I've ever been given is that nobody does it alone. And I think that that's literal in the sense that if you're pitching or publishing your writing, you're probably working with an editor and copy editor, a fact checker, a whole team of people who support your story and help get it into the world. And beyond that, if you're interviewing, if you're reporting, your sources are part of what you're creating too. There was one labor expert and organizer that I talked to for the book that I thought put it really well. We were talking about the language surrounding overwork and how you hear a lot of these sort of pseudo aspirational terms in job listings and how work is described. And I'm thinking of stuff you all have probably heard as students as well, like going above and beyond, going the extra mile, being the first one there and the last to leave. And they told me that there's this saying about climbing the ladder, going up the ladder. And I think that that's one that we've probably all heard some form or fashion of. And it really underscored how individualistic and isolating that overwork can be because we can't stand next to each other on a ladder. And when I was talking to this source, one of the points they made that I just loved was that when we think about ambition and it being this individualistic thing, this thing we have to do alone, and we play the opposites game, they said that the opposite of ambition is not actually rest or doing nothing or deciding that you're not going to work anymore, which let's be honest, is not a reality for most of us. But the opposite of that kind of individualistic, isolated ambition is collectivity. And through that collectivity, we get the power of imagination where we can imagine together what can be better and how things can be different. And now I think about that all the time, not just in terms of ambition, but how I approach my work. How can I bring other people in? How can I connect other people who have great ideas and should be working together? How can I kind of not step forward as one person, but be part of a whole community of people? And I think that that's one of the really special things about what you all have done with your afternoon today, making time to hear other people speak up and ask questions and kind of be together that is such an ambitious pursuit, even if you don't write anything after this, even if this is the rest of your day, you're just hanging out and relaxing. To me, that's ambition. The fact that you cared enough to show up with other people to invest your time in them, invest your energy, your listening, your compassion, all of these things. And that'll shape how I write and report moving forward, I think. I just talked so much more than I have ever <laughs> talked on a Zoom call before. Um, so I would love to get to talk to you all and hear about your ideas or your questions about any of this or anything else. I've got a Google Doc of questions up here. I'm going to try my best to 
do both of these things at once. Okay, the first one I'm seeing here, and I apologize in advance if I get people's names wrong, Isabella. How is a book different from writing articles? Do you feel that doing both types of writing is particularly beneficial? This is such an interesting question. Um, I think I think a lot of the work that I've done writing freelance pieces inform the work that I did on the book. Um, the things that I write about in the book are things that had come up in prior reporting anyway, and that's kind of what helped spark the idea that maybe this could be a book. Maybe there was enough there to fill pages to be a book um, is conversations I was having with sources. I think the biggest thing that involved a hefty learning curve for me with both books is pacing. Um, I had to learn, you know, we're not writing a 1200 word piece or a 1500 word piece or even a 5000 word piece, we're writing something that has to sustain all of these pages and figuring out how different pieces fit together, how I was going to weave all of this together felt really intimidating. Um, it also gave me a lot of opportunity to think out loud and bring in many more voices that I would have been able to in a piece. Um, I think that writing in all different styles and forms is fantastic and massively beneficial. I would say that I wouldn't have been able to write either book if I hadn't written the freelance pieces and had those experiences that I'd had with editors. Um, so I think the biggest difference is the length and the endurance but the thing that they had in common was definitely how I approached talking to sources and how I approached interviewing. Okay, let's see, next question here. I am so sorry if I mess up your name. Laia, please correct me. Um, I hate getting people's names wrong and I'm so sorry about that, but this is a great question. How would one who has the need for financial stability but is having a period of lacking ambition move forward? Yeah, this is something that came up over and over again when I was reporting the book because a lot of people don't feel like they have an option but to overwork. And the reason that they don't feel like they have an option is that because for most of us, it's not one. Um, without things like a universal basic income, without universal health care, without the support we need, it's the onus is kind of put back on us to secure these things through work. Um, and I wish that that was not the case. The people I spoke to in the book wish that was not the case. And I think that where everyone can, they're working on it. Um, but I think a couple of things about this question. I think number one, let go of the pressure to feel ambitious about your job. Your job can just be a job. It can be the thing that you do to pay your bills, to make sure that you can have food on the table and that you can pay your rent. And that can truly be it. I think that especially for young people, there is a tremendous amount of pressure to have every kind of work you do be something that you want to do in the future, that you want to list on a resume or on a college application. And I think that that's way too much stress. I also have a day job because of the same reasons that you're describing here. I need the financial security. I need to have that to kind of fall back on. So I think number one, let go of the idea that you have to be ambitious about your work. And number two, I would say where you can, and again, I know this is easier said than done, try to find things that do make you feel, if not ambitious, invested or creative or imaginative in some way. And those could be such simple things. It could be a phone call to catch up with your friend. It could be writing just for yourself, not necessarily pitching anything, but just kind of thinking aloud on the page. Even if it's 10 minutes a day, try to find that outlet where it feels like it lights a spark in you. Not because of the work you're doing, but because you need to know that you can still feel encouraged and inspired by things that are happening in your life, even if work is not the outlet for that right now. Emma asked, do you think other societies frame ambition in better ways than a country like America? This is a great question. So I'll, I'll kind of caveat this by saying that most of my book does focus specifically on 
American culture and um, how it upholds a certain kind of ambition. But from the experts I talked to while reporting this book, I think I think places with a more robust social safety net have a much different version of ambition than we do. Um, I think that in America, ambition is presented as something where, depending on who you are, your circumstances, who's around you, you're either too ambitious, where you are asking for too much, you are too wanting, or you are not ambitious enough, and you are supposed to single-handedly out-ambition whatever circumstances that you happen to be in. Um, And I think that that comes because of the fact that there is very little, little structural support. There isn't space to be ambitious about much outside of work if we get the opportunity to do that. And so I think that a healthier, more sustainable approach to ambition first has to have a safety net underneath it. Because it's one thing to tell people, you know, don't overwork. Your job is not your life, except for so many people, they are working in order to have a life. They are working to survive. And so I think that when there are more supports in place for people, it gives them the freedom to make more choices and to experience more things. And as a result of that, it really profoundly shifts the relationship to ambition. Mm, Nicole asked a great question. In terms of the essays that you write, where do you find the inspiration behind them? I feel like there's so much to write about in this world, but for some reason, my mind draws blank when I think of potential pitches. I am exactly the same way on pitching. Um, This is a funny thing that I've started (laughs) lately where when I sit down at the computer to write a pitch, my mind instantly goes blank and I'm convinced that I will never have another idea. Um, What works for me is usually literally going outside. It's going to do something that is completely unrelated to writing and then kind of jotting down the bones of an idea as it comes to me in a notebook, if I've got a notebook, uh, in my phone, if I've got my phone. So I think that especially when it comes to essays, the first thing I would say is give yourself some space to think about something that is not the essay. Something I've thought about a lot over the past couple years is the difference between writing about a personal experience for myself because it's something I need to get down on paper, I need to get out and writing about it because it's gonna find a reader. And it took me a long time to navigate the difference between those things. And to be honest with you all, it led to me writing some essays early in my career that I wouldn't necessarily be proud of now um, because I felt a lot of pressure to write about these personal experiences, thinking that, you know, I need to write what I know. And right now, this is what I know. So I think that the experience comes from usually the inspiration comes from an experience that I've had. I recently wrote an essay about obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which I turns out have had since I was a child and really came into fruition in some pretty crushing ways later in adulthood. And the inspiration behind that was something I'd felt myself, the burden of dealing with this thing that for so long I didn't know how to name, but what kind of built it into a pitch was figuring out how it intersected with other things beyond me. In this case, it was how it intersected with my ambition, with overwork, and with kind of how we think of OCD in the media and kind of the narratives surrounding that that are often profoundly incorrect. Um, So I think Give yourself space to think about something beyond the essay pitch. Think about how it intersects with other things beyond you, whether that's other people, whether that's other issues that you're thinking about right now, and kind of give yourself some time. I think the thing with essays is that they can take a really long time to take the form that they're supposed to take. So even if you don't pitch it right now, you might a year from now or five years from now, give yourself that grace to kind of find the through line of what ideas or what experiences stick with you and lend themselves to unpacking in an essay. Okay, let's see. Jan asked, how can you reconcile living a fulfilling life with needing to pay the bills? Yeah, this is another phenomenal question. I think I got into this a little bit earlier because I think that 
yeah, you're exactly right. We Someone's ability to work or the kind of work they do, in my opinion, should not have a bearing on their ability to live a safe, fulfilled, dignified life. These should be things that are afforded to all of us because we are people and we are living in a society together. They should not have to be earned through ambition. And that's one of the things that I tried really hard to talk to people about when I was reporting the book and figure out how that was showing up for them, because it's a tremendous amount of pressure just to get by, and it shouldn't be. And then you heap pressure to achieve through work or through school on top of that, and it's just completely unbearable, and it's devastating. I think a couple of things about this question. Number one, I think that living a fulfilled life can look like a lot of different things. I think for a lot of us, maybe that comes through our work in some way, that it's something we're invested in, we feel like it's meaningful in some way, but it doesn't have to come through work and it doesn't have to come through school. You can derive your fulfillment from your relationships with other people, how you cultivate your friendships, how you show up in your community, the conversations you have. And I think that these things really get pushed to the back burner because number one, people don't have the time and resources to pursue them in a meaningful way. And number two, because they're not things that we earn. And there's such an emphasis on earning anything good that we have in this life. And these are things that they might be earned through our listening, through our patience, through our time. And But they're not earned through achievement. You're not going to achieve your way into friendship. You're probably not going to achieve your way into community. So I think for me, it's been helpful when I'm thinking about trying to get by and paying student loans when that pause unfreezes and all of this stuff to think about where else I can find meaning and fulfillment that is not necessarily tied to work. And I know it can sound too hard. It can sound really superficial in some ways, but I also also think it's the thing that sustains us to keep pushing for better and keep trying to support each other where we can. Aaron has asked a question that I wish I would learn the answer to. How can you tell when persistence will pay off and when you should stop or change tracks? So I think that there's a couple ways to think about this question. I, in terms of journalism and pitching, um, to me, when I have pitched a story a couple different places or I've kind of reconfigured the angle a couple different ways and it's just not sticking for whatever reason, that's usually a sign to me that I need to go back to the drawing board and maybe think about what is or isn't working. Like if there's a different angle that I can take on this story, if there's part of the conversation I'm missing, if there's information I'm lacking. So I think that that's kind of the most direct answer to that question is a lot of the time with pitches, I'll think, well, I pitched this before it was ready to be pitched, or now's just not a good time to work on this story. And there have been stories that I have pitched that just haven't landed, it's just not clicking. And then a year or two later, all of a sudden I'll come across a piece of information or I'll have a conversation with a source that all of a sudden snaps the pieces of this other thing that I wasn't even working on into place. And it's really exciting when that happens. It's a good reason to keep a Google Doc or a Word Doc or notebook of all of your ideas because you never know how something's going to fit together in the future, even if it doesn't shake out right then. But I also think, you know, there's another way to look at this. And I think it's in terms of, you know, career and life. And I think that if you're at a point where you feel like you've exhausted all the avenues, you're not feeling encouraged or like things are clicking in, in your work or in a part of your life, I think that that might be a sign that you need to do something new. And I think a lot of the time when we hear do something new in terms of our work or our lives or school, it's these really big, significant, profound changes that are really overwhelming. And I think we can start smaller. I think it can be reading something different. I think it can can be finding a new group of people to connect with in some way and having different kinds of conversations. I think that a lot of our thinking really thrives on novelty. Our brains like new things and new experiences. And so if you feel like you're running up against that wall where things just aren't falling the way you want them to, I would encourage you even just in a small way 
to try to get outside your comfort zone and do something different or have a different kind of conversation. Let's see. Lisa asked, our culture is ingrained in us. Competitiveness, persistence. How do you separate yourself from cultural prompts to achieve more faster? I think that this is kind of the question that I'll be asking a version of for the rest of my life. Um, because one of the things that it was really important for me, to, to me, to point out in the book is that this idea of achievement and the idea that certain achievements carry more weight and that doing them on a certain timeline carries more weight and what it means to be ambitious and who gets to be ambitious are all things that are just kind of happening on an individual scale, like that we're all opting in to feeling really competitive today or that we're all opting in to the idea that we need to persist no matter what. And I, what I love about this question is it gets to the heart of it that this is a cultural expectation. It's something that is upheld through how we think about what it means to be successful and who gets that. It's in school, it's in work, it's in how we think about what achievement or success looks like. And so I think the things that came up in reporting are number one, whether you are a reporter, whether you are involved in some sort of advocacy work, which I know a lot of students uh, here today are, whether it's just in your own community or your school, I think pushing for better structural, better structures for this is crucial to all the rest of it. Because as we've seen, even in this conversation, you can't tell someone, hey, don't work so hard if they're having to work to survive. And so I think that that's number one, is that it kind of starts at the root of it. And number two, I think that this is a, a tricky one, but I think you have to have conversations with yourself about what matters and why it matters to you. And it is so hard, you all. I don't think that there is a, a person alive that has not looked at some point at someone else's byline or accomplishment or idea and gone, well, <laughs> I really wish that had been me. I'm never going to get to where that person is. I'm not doing enough. And I think that we have to own that a little bit. I think we have to accept that to some degree, that's kind of the water we're swimming in. But what we can do is step back and ask ourselves, okay, why does this matter to me? Where does that come from? Is this something that I need to achieve to improve my material circumstances? Like I have to go to my job to pay my bills. That's really valid. Is this something I'm intrinsically motivated to do? Like, do I want that byline or to get into that school or whatever it is for a reason that feels really meaningful and specific to me? Have I thought through why this thing matters? Or is it an external expectation? Do I feel like I need to achieve it because if I'm not outrunning the person next to me, I'm not doing a good enough job? Is my teacher, parent, adult in your life in some other capacity going to be disappointed in me if I don't do this thing. And I think that those conversations are, first of all, really difficult to have with yourself. And second of all, again, are kind of pushed to the back burner. They're kind of thought of as extras because our whole culture is around just keep going no matter what. And I think the more you can zoom out and think about why you're trying to achieve something and how that shows up in your life, the more it gives you an opportunity to reflect on whether the amount you're investing in it actually aligns with why you're pursuing it in the first place. And I also encourage everyone to have those conversations with your friends and your peers, because I think the thing about this sort of achievement is that it's deeply isolating. When we're in competition with each other, it makes it so we're not supposed to talk to each other about what's wrong or what could be better. And I think every time you have a conversation with a peer or a colleague or a group of people that you know through some other means, it offers opportunities for us to kind of get into the thick of what this means and how it's impacting all of us in different ways. And I think that's something the competitive part really doesn't want us to do. It doesn't want us to talk to each other, which in my opinion means we should talk to each other as much as we can. Maddie asked, what can we do to combat the ideas and stereotypes around ambition, especially in communities around us? Great question. So I think it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about. I think that we can, number one, talk to one another. I think that when you talk to your 
teachers, your peers, your friends. I think that all of that doesn't just shift the conversation. I think that it kind of changes the culture around what the stereotype of ambition is. I think that that's really important. So number one, talk to other people. Number two, this is this is going to sound really silly, but stay with me. We need to celebrate more things that aren't traditionally celebrated or thought of as accomplishments. Like you've, I'm sure if you've gotten a piece published, if you've written a pitch, if you have, you know, gotten a great grade on a test at school, I hope that you have stopped for a second to congratulate yourself on that and notice that it's a big deal. But where you can, I also hope that you've paused to congratulate yourself when you've asked for help, when you need it when you've been able to take a break, when you have tried something new, even if it's failed. I think that being able to stop and think, I was ambitious about that. I put care into that. I put time into that. I think all of that adds up to kind of changing the stereotype of what and who ambition looks like. Let's see. John asked, it sounds like networking, having a peer group and access to sources is really important. How do you successfully network? This is an awesome one. Um, and again, I can kind of think about this in two ways. You know, I was talking about earlier in a breakout room that when I first started freelancing to talk about this specific to journalism, I really thought that I needed to do everything by myself and that if I asked for help, I was kind of confessing that I wasn't quite qualified to do the thing that I was trying to do. And now I know that all great work happens through collaboration of some form or another. And so I think that in terms of journalism and how you network, I think you start by engaging with other people's work. I, I hate what's happened to Twitter because honestly, Twitter was a phenomenal way for me to do this. All of a sudden, it gave me a space to not just follow a publication, but to follow writers whose work or whose voice or whose reporting really stood out to me and really connected with me. And I think that a lot of some of my best friends now who are journalists, it started with us DMing each other like, hey, I really liked your piece on this thing. Or, hey, I noticed that you worked with this editor. What was that experience like? I think it can be really intimidating to start those conversations. But at least in my experience, if you approach it as building a true relationship with somebody and really being invested in not just their work, but who they are as a person and their well-being. I think that goes a long way in number one, building really strong relationships through networking, but also making sure it doesn't feel transactional, like you're just trying to get information out of them. I think it creates space where you can ask questions and you can brainstorm ideas. And I think that that's one of the most valuable parts of having a community of peers and colleagues is that you're not in it by yourself. You have all of these other people to kind of lean on and think things through with. And in sourcing, I think that it's really similar. I think it's about slowing down long enough to build a rapport with somebody, to have an actual conversation with them, um, one of the best, you know, pieces of advice that I've ever been given was, you know, when you're interviewing somebody, you're having a conversation with them. And at least when I think about reporting for the book, there were people who were sitting on the phone or on Zoom with me telling me really profoundly personal things about their life. Um, and no source owes me their life story or this kind of information. And so I think that treating that with a level of respect and care and kind of walking them through what the process looks like, showing them clips that maybe you've written before so they can get a sense of your work, asking them at the end of the conversation if there's anything that you didn't ask but they want to share with you or something you should have asked. I think all of that goes a really long way to building a, a true rapport with a source and, and a relationship with them. And I think that a lot of really phenomenal reporting and stories comes out of those more sustained relationships. Kiki asks, are there any practices you use to reduce burnout and increase productivity and energy? I am still practicing this one, you all. I'm going to be honest. Um, I, think that, I think that there are a couple. And the first thing I would say is that these are probably going to look a little bit different for everybody. For example, if I am anxious about work or I'm feeling burnt out and someone tells me, 
why don't you just do nothing? <laughs> I have to remind myself that doesn't work for me. That actually makes me more anxious. Sometimes it's not always about doing less work. It's about what you add in that does feel really restorative and good. So there are a couple things that I do. I really try to get out from behind my screens, which I know is advice you all have probably heard too much, but just giving my brain a chance to reset, go out and see the sunlight, say hi to a neighbor, call a friend on the phone, something that gives you the space to sort of take your mind out of that work environment. And I think that that can be a literal like workplace, but I also think that for a lot of us, it is on our phones and our computers where even if we're not actively working, the work is sitting right there with us. So figure out what you can do to create some space that feels restorative. And I think that restorative can mean a lot of different things. I think it can be literally making time to rest. I think it can be having fun. I think it can be venting to a friend and catching up with them and feeling like you are a part of a conversation, like you're engaged in something and kind of have to think it through. But I think it all comes back to figuring out what you can add in, even in small ways to your day-to-day -day life that give you a sense of reprieve. And it doesn't have to be anything big. You don't have to overhaul everything because I know that's stressful too. It's just thinking about what can I add that gives me a little bit of a break today, even if it's five or 10 minutes that just feel more restorative than the rest of your day. I think that can go a long way. Harris, I'm so sorry if I'm getting people's names wrong again, asked a phenomenal question. I'd love to hear your all's thoughts on this. In an industry that has a heavy focus on external validation, sharing work and asking for criticism, how would you recommend strengthening your own internal confidence as a writer? Oh my gosh. I wish that I could show you all the conversation I had with Peter uh, last week on Zoom when we were preparing for what I was going to talk about today, um, because confidence is something I struggle with a lot. I have struggled with being confident since I was a kid. I thought that would change in adulthood, and I have to tell you that for me, it has not. Um, and so I think that there are two things that I kind of come back to. And number one is that if I waited until I felt confident about something to try it, I would probably be waiting a very long time, quite possibly forever. And that's going to vary person to person. Sometimes it's really smart and really wise to wait. And it's always wise to think something through before you pitch it, before you share it. If you can get feedback on it, I think that that's phenomenal. If it's feedback that you can apply, I think that that's even better. Um, so I don't want this to sound like just try it and see what happens because it is more complicated than that. I think you want to have done your due diligence and really thought through something that you're pitching and writing before you do it. I think it makes it a better story. But for example, if I had waited until I was like, I can do this, I've got this, to send my first pitch, it probably never would have come. So I think give yourself some grace in knowing that you don't have to be confident. What you have to do is be willing to try, be willing to take and apply feedback. And if something goes really wrong, being able to take accountability and own that mistake, I think goes a long way. And the other part of this I'll say is that, you know, I am, as you all might be able to tell by the fact that I'm like shaking during this conversation, I'm not great at talking about myself. It still feels really hard. And when you're promoting a book, they ask you a lot of questions and talking about your own work. And at the time, a lot of the time, I don't know the answers. I'm like, I don't know why anyone would want to ask me a question. This is terribly stressful. I'm uncomfortable. But the part I shift back to and that I come back to every time and that I kind of lean on is that the issues that my sources in a story or in this book talk about, they matter so much more than how I feel about the story. I am so invested in figuring out how I can share what these people have shared with me, the problems that they're trying to solve, the issues that they're raising. I feel so strongly about that, that it kind of overrides the other. And it's kind of shifted how I think about my work, where I get 
really invested in the conversations that I have and the reporting that I do. And I think that when you feel that strongly that the people you've talked to have something important to say, it can kind of help work around any issue of confidence. And last thing I'll say is that a lot of sharing work, you get more comfortable with it as time goes. It doesn't feel so daunting every single time. And not to keep bringing everything back to community, but I do think that over time, as you foster a community of peers and writers you admire, you realize that you kind of have this built-in support system who want to read your work, they want to celebrate it, they want to see it do well because they know that it's important. And I think that that really helps too. Paul asked, is it possible to become a great journalist without being very ambitious in a conventional way? Ooh, this is fascinating. I think yes and no. I think when, when I think of a great journalist, I think a lot of the people, in my opinion, who do great work and are great journalists are actually ambitious about things that would not necessarily show up in traditional spaces of ambition. I think that they seem, and when I say ambition, I'm talking about the amount of care and intention and drive that they put into something. I think that when I think great journalists, they're ambitious about listening, they're ambitious about justice, they're ambitious about building a sustained relationship with the people they're talking to, they're ambitious just about accountability. And I think what kind of separates these things is that they're all a little bit separate for, from achievement because they're all about the process instead of the output. And to me, that's one of the things that makes a great journalist and in my opinion, makes really great work is that when it's somebody who cares and has put so much into the process of their reporting, the process of the story they're telling, that that really shows on the page or as you're scrolling reading it. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot to be said about hitting traditional benchmarks of success. I, I feel like I have a little bit of a funky perspective on that because, for example, you know, I've never been a staff writer. I've never been a breaking news reporter. And I imagine that there is a lot of competition in those spaces to be the one that gets the scoop, to achieve a certain job title or to win an award. But again, I think it all comes back to being driven and invested in the process of doing the work that gets you those things. And to me, that's also what makes really ambitious journalism. Blake asked, you mentioned capitalism a few times. Do you think it's even possible in a capitalist society to have a healthy relationship with ambition? Um, the short answer is no. I think it's possible for our relationship with ambition to be healthier than it is and to try to practice how ambition shows up in different spaces. But, you know, I think all the time there was a source in the book who I'm not going to get the quote perfect off the top of my head, but asked me, you know, basically, what would ambition look like in a society where everyone had their basic needs met? Would there be such a thing? I think that there would be, but I think it would look very different. Um, I don't think that it's a matter of us needing to get rid of ambition or us not feeling ambitious, and that's kind of the antidote to everything. I think it's blowing up ambition to think about it much more broadly than we do. And I think because so much of capitalism is driven by this idea of, scarcity and competition and you're only as good as the last thing you produced and you better have climbed over top of someone else to get there. I think that really distorts what ambition is. I think that we can be ambitious in ways that are not competitive at all. I think we can be driven in ways that again are more about the process than the output at the end. And I think that that's a really different kind of ambition than the one we've currently got. Um, so I don't know about <laughs> a healthy relationship. I think that how we think about and how we experience ambition is always going to be shaped in some form or fashion by capitalism. But I also think that there is a form of ambition that involves pushing back really hard against that. John asked, a lot of our teachers, bosses, higher ups encourage an unhealthy work ethic or an ambition that doesn't serve us. Which mentors taught you to reframe your ambition? I love this question because I think that the more we can sing the praises of people who have helped us in our work and think about our ideas or think about how we move through the world, the more we can kind of push back on this myth of like, 
the self-created person and that you did all of this alone in a vacuum. Of course I didn't. I think that I think that honestly, my friends who are not mentors, they're just their peers and colleagues. I think that they've helped me reframe my relationship to ambition. I think that over the course of conversations with them and getting to hear what they're ambitious about that's different from mine, how they wish I was showing up better in our relationships, what seems to be working well in their lives and what isn't clicking. I think those have always been invaluable parts of thinking through ambition. I think that in terms of mentors, I am lucky enough to have worked with some editors that honestly totally changed the course of my life. And I think that every time I have had to ask for an extension or I've had to say, I'm kind of stuck on this piece of the story or this source hasn't fallen through. And instead of them approaching that as something I did wrong, but a problem we are going to solve together, I think that that has been a game changer for me in ways that I didn't even comprehend until pretty recently, honestly. Um, and, you know, I've also had bosses who have done the complete opposite. I've had bosses who do exactly what you're talking about, where it's self-sacrifice, achieve at all costs. You better be willing to do anything for this work. And in my opinion, that just it it's not sustainable. And so when I think about mentors, I think about people like my editor at Teen Vogue. I think about editors I've worked with at Scallywag. I think about my agent and my editor on this book who have all shown me through their behavior and through their actions that there is a different way to approach this. Those are the people that have changed my thinking on so many things, not just ambition. And the thing that I've taken away from that is that we all have the opportunity to do that for somebody else. Even if you're not a boss, even if you're not in a mentorship role, even if you don't necessarily have the power to change the system, we do have the ability and I think the responsibility to look out for each other and to celebrate each other and to try where we can to be that support that somebody can lean on when they need help, when they need to take a break, when they're thinking about something differently. Um, and to me, that's the most ambitious thing we could possibly do is take care of each other where we can. You all, these questions have been phenomenal. They have been challenging. And I'm so grateful to you all for listening to me talk for so long and for thinking so deeply about this. It's been an honor to be in conversation with you. Um, I will hop off, but before I go, you all have a break, take a breather, get some water until the final keynote session at five o'clock. Thank you all so much. Um, if I can ever be of help to anyone, I'll make sure that everybody gets my email and have a great final session of the conference. <laughs>